<clears throat> when people ask me, uh, you know, and this happens almost every day, but the, the terminology somebody might say or, or what role do you play at Unity? What, what is Unity of Sedona? I, I, I can't really call it a church. What role do you play? Am I a priest? No. Um, well, so what am I exactly? So we just kind of got used to describing this as part of a spiritual leadership. But I love the fact that we're sort of all participating in that. This is kind of a, we're all moving and grooving together. Now, I'm saying this in part because of what you, you could expect. The more you practice this and live this, whether it's in your workplace or your home, you're still going to generally be the oddball. You know, you're, you're going to be the one that doesn't quite fit in at the family reunions. You know, uh, um, I, I've gone to family things, you know, it's been, it, oh my God, it must have been at least 10, 15 years that I've gone to any family function because you, you're my family now and, you know, and that's it. But, but, you know, it's been a long time. But, they, you know, when they look at me and they're all in suits, <laughs> I've worn a tie, I think, once in my life. And, um, <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it's just not really our thing, right? So I, I go to a family function once, and if I wear shirts like this, you know, and they, they think, what are you? You know, so you're going to get that. Jesus got that. Buddha got that. You know, you're going to get that. This is part of the path. We have to remember that our Dealing with life stuff mainly comes not by your reactions to it or wishing it didn't happen, but by your immunity. That you be, you're just so centered in who you are, it doesn't matter what they say. And we do shift out of seeing things as right and wrong, and there's all kinds of various definitions about that. There is no wrong. Well, if I kick you, I'm actually wrong for kicking you. Be, meaning I'm coming from my hateful mind, and that's, that's not my healthy self. So it's okay to say, I can make healthier and healthier choices. Yet it's tricky because we're saying there's no good, there's no bad, meaning don't judge it. Don't, don't get caught up in the human perceptions of right and wrong. Just recognize human perceptions of wrong are just as, in a sense, part of the limited world as what we perceive as wrong. Because it's still me thinking. It's still me perceiving. At the end of the day, all of the horrible things that have ever happened will disappear into nothingness. It have no power but disappear into nothingness. What we don't like to hear is so will the nice things. We go, oh, no, no, no. I want my childhood abuse to be gone, but daffodils I want forever. It doesn't work that way. That's why we haven't yet let go of this world because we still think we need to give God a checklist of which things we still want to have around. You know, I want to let go of factories, but I still want to keep my organic food place. <laughs> When you realize that all, all food's an illusion, all of it disappears. But humans just haven't acclimated yet to that. So when people ask questions, and, and tangible, good, valuable questions, normal questions, what, what are you? What are you about? I go to a family arena. What are you about? I don't know. And generally what I do is I search my mind for the, the best answer for them. Not because I'm letting them limit my answer. It's called love and respect. So if I'm talking to one group of people, family, some family, I might say, I'm a counselor. Oh, because that sounds semi-respectable, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I can't go, well, um, I do this thing where we hang out in Sedona. Oh, Sedona. Huh? <laughs> yeah, and we all just kind of chant, you know, and we just kind of sing and, and, and so on. And sometimes people have seen UFOs out the window behind me when I'm talking and angels and... Uh, you, you can't do that at family reunions. It just, it just doesn't go well. So I, I generally try to find, it's called the greater good. What answer would be the greater good? Now, some of you say, no, I'm not going to say what they need. I want to speak. Well, that's the wounded you that still needs to be loud, which is probably the original obnoxious part of you that they didn't like in the first place. <laughs> so... What's nice is you just, you just get so clear, I don't have to answer, I don't have to say anything. I don't have to prove anything. So you become so clear, you, you actually are capable of thinking for the all instead of the self. I need to say it's, what would be the best answer for everybody right now? I'm a, I'm a counselor. Oh, okay, yeah. And inside, you know, there's laughter, I mean, to a degree, because you realize what you're doing, but it's, it's beautiful. And people say, you know, are you the, uh, 
you know, such and such. Here, I'm, I'm part of the spiritual leadership. You know, I answer that on a regular basis. And, and sometimes I think maybe people think that I'm being evasive by not giving them an answer that seems normal, but I'm giving them an answer that's true. If they say, are you, um, are you the pastor? Uh, no, but I might give them, because they, they, sometimes what they're asking is, are you involved here? Are you a, a leader? And then I sometimes would have to say yes, because that's what they're asking for and that's what they need. But just understand, it is tricky to answer some of those simple questions. And if it's difficult for me, it's going to be or is also going to be the same for you. What are you? What do you believe in? What religion are you? What do you answer anymore? Um, I'm no religion and yet all religion. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you get philosophical? How do you answer? How do you answer these questions anymore? I don't, I don't know. You know, um, and I, I just pray and ask for the best answer for where they're at. And then sometimes it's nice just to say, what, what do you practice? And when they say, oh, I practice this and that, what's nice is if you have a diversity behind you, you can say, oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. See, now you connect with them. Mm -hmm. And you also change the subject. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, there is a little bit of that. The, the concept, some people have asked this week, can you talk about, like, God and our place in God and how this is reality and illusion? And So I want to share something with you. The Bible tells us this. You know, this concept of Genesis. In the beginning, there was, I'm just paraphrasing, but in the beginning, there's this void. This void, this empty space. And God creates heaven and earth. And this is important because human beings then think that's the scriptures telling us God created the heaven and earth, you know, earth and, and the universe. And then we read A Course in Miracles and it says God actually didn't create anything material. So we say, well, that sounds like a contradiction. In the Bible, it says that God created heaven and earth, and then it says, and the earth was without form. You know what that means? God creates in consciousness. So there's an earth that we know not of because we're busy looking at the one we can see. God created a universe but formless, meaning without limited dimensionality. See? God created all things in consciousness and in a, in a frequency of perfection. Perfection meaning it's not taintable. It, it's, it's something that is eternal. Even planets and stars can die. So there's a universe that cannot die or perish or be limited in any way. And then there's our universe. The ones we started as co-creators coming in. As soon as we got into a fearful state of mind, which we can't go into all the details of that. But as soon as we decided we're limited beings, we then man manufactured a, a limited universe. God created an unlimited one. We, when we started believing we're limited beings, co-created with God and said, thank you for that beautiful, formless, limitless dimensionality or, or non-dimensionality for that matter. And we have something to add to that. Limitation. So we created, a, a, yeah, I know it sounds kind of strange, but so we created this, a, a limited universe. And then it says in the Bible, and then God said, let there be light. And then God divided the light from the dark and said, you know, this is now day and night. Simple enough. Now there's something called, now understand, that's the Bible. And where did the Bible get that? And people go, well, God wrote it. Yeah, that's right. God got a pen and wrote. Oh, no, no. It was a typewriter. Oh, no, wait. It was, well, how far do you go with this? God carved it in rock. God didn't write it as we know it. And before the Bible's creation story, they got that from the Assyrians and Babylonian, you know, peoples and uh, Babylonians and Sumerians. So, so this has been passed down since the beginning. Even stories about Jesus became a manifestation of something that ancients were already talking about. It's still beautiful because what he did was he became the embodiment of it. But the concepts were already there. In Greek mythology, we're talking about a long time before the recorded history of Genesis and the Torah. The Greeks had already said almost the same story. But in Greek mythology, they say in the beginning there was this formless void called chaos. And again, they use the term chaos. Chaos for some reason gets interspersed with that. But there's this form formless void and it becomes the mother. And you've heard me say many times, the universe is the womb of the mother 
And all things are created, that all things that manifest are an expression of the mother so she can mirror back to us our consciousness. So the Greeks are saying there's this chaos and this, you know, this emptiness, and then it becomes, the I'm calling it the womb, but it becomes the mother. And then the mother, you know, says, and, and mother is also in this called nix or night, which is also where you get the word nil, meaning nothingness, yet everything will come from this. The womb is this place of darkness in which all things are created. The womb is like a dark, a metaphor of this dark space. But look what happens in the womb, a quickening takes place and a child is born. But this isn't talking about a physical womb. It's talking about the womb of consciousness. There's a moment where God says, let there be light. And that's our creation. But then there's also this empty void, which is the moment we said, what if we're not the light of God? Now darkness suddenly happened. And we have a choice. And the mother's saying, I'm an empty canvas waiting. I can reflect to you that you are perfect light of God, or I can reflect that you're afraid and limited. Whatever you want me to reflect, I will objectively reflect and show you where you are. Why? Because if I show you where you are and you believe you're a limited, pain, painful being, then maybe that'll encourage you to wake up and come back to the light. See, it's all about trying to get us back home. But she doesn't force it, she just holds space in more ways than one. So in some stories, this mother also becomes the mother of Cupid. And in the Greek mythologies, Cupid ends up penetrating the earth and turning the earth into a place of life. So what I'm saying is that the Greeks have this way of saying the same thing, but before the Bible was written, saying the same thing, but using these metaphors of, you know, it's Nix and it's void, but they're using characters. But in Greek myth uh, cosmology, not now mythology, they say it differently. They say, well, the beginning, there's, there's, they, they're calling it gods, but we call it planets. There's this being, Uranus. And Uranus meets and joins with the earth, or Gaia. Uranus represents heaven, yin and yang in Chinese, uh, you know, in Asian uh, uh, stories. But Uranus joins with Gaia, who is earth, and they start to give birth to other beings. They give birth to the Titans. One of the Titans is Saturn. And I'll be brief with this, but just keep up with me. They give birth to the Titans. One of them is Saturn, who becomes known as Satan, which is why people don't like Saturn returns in their life, because that is cosmologically, astrologically, Satan coming back to what? Well, linear thinking and religions went, Satan's the bad guy that ruins your day. People that see things as a big picture, they go, no, Satan is Saturn that comes back to teach you your lessons every so often. Besides, what could Satan, if there's a Satan in hell sitting around going, I need more people, I'm getting bored. You know, just, I need more people to punish. You know, what, what could it punish you for if it wasn't your own things, issues? So Saturn, see how it, it becomes objective and beautiful? Where Saturn every so comes around, you know, every so often to bring us back and mirror these things to us again. So, also known as Kronos and all that, but it's, it's Saturn. And then Saturn battles with Uranus and wounds him. And, and the blood from, uh, from, from Uranus becomes what's called in, in Greek cosmology, mythology, the Furies. But what the Greeks are doing is giving names to things. You can just say, I'm so angry today. The Greeks would say, you're being tempted by the Furies. You see what the word Fury means? They think of everything as having consciousness, not just a mood. It's a thing. It's a, it's a, you're dealing battle with consciousness. Edgar Cayce talked about things sometimes, you know, health things, right? But sometimes he talked about surgery. And he would say something like surgical forces are needed to improve the circulatory forces. He didn't say your blood. Humans are so linear now, especially in the Western world. The ancients in the Chinese systems and in the Greek mythology, we were living in this whole system of consciousness. There's this whole system. So planets weren't just this and that, and it wasn't just beings. It's our dance with the consciousness of the Furies. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more on that. But at some point, Kronos or, or Saturn gives birth with his beloved. They give birth to Pluto, Neptune, and Jupiter. The reason I'm saying this is because we end up with a planetary version. Once upon a time, there's da 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 da, and the, you know, heaven and earth create children, the Titans, the Titans, one of them becomes Saturn. Saturn goes on and battles with Uranus, you know, and so on and so on. But at some point, children are birthed. Again, these gods of Olympus. 
And the final of them is Jupiter, not final, but a, a finale is Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is also known as, it's Jupiter, right? Pitar means father. So, Ju, Ju means, the Jupiter means uh, um, like God the Father. And Ju means Theos or Theo. Dios, in all these different languages, they're talking about God. But the ancients said that the God a lot of people talk to is just Jupiter. It's, and even, even Jehovah. They're all just this one God of the ancients. Now you can say, well, that gets too complicated. Actually, it simplifies. It means that there are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in all your philosophies. It means that sometimes that people prayed to a God, it was just one aspect of God. They were personifying it and saying, oh, I'm talking to the one and only God. And Jupiter is saying, oh, okay. You know, if that's all you understand for now. And yet look at how the mythologies were saying to us, today you're talking to Jupiter, God the Father, as we pray and look to the heavens, God the Father. But notice that there's another God, Saturn, that's going to bring your stuff around every so often. So there's more than one being because there's more than one aspect of our consciousness. Ultimately, it'll all dissolve, no names, no gods, no goddesses, to the oneness of absolute, the bliss of God. But in the meantime, it seems to have become a bit, you know, complicated. Now, and, and this is also Zeus, Zeus, Theos, see, Zeus. So we name this guy Zeus. Zeus has a daughter named Persephone. Why am I telling you this? Because you are Persephone. God had a daughter. Persephone represents Eve and our soul. So after all this mythology, you go, well, this is interesting, but you know, it's a lecture about Greek mythology. No. The point was that the Bible corresponds with Greek mythology and corresponds with cosmology and astrology at the end of the day. And then where do we fit into this so we can make it practical? Because one of those gods, Theo, Zeus, has a daughter named Persephone. What happens to Persephone? She gets trapped. She gets captured, kidnapped. This is the stories and mythologies of one called Sophia. And Sophia is our soul. Because the story of Sophia or Persephone is she's beautiful, she's innocent. That's you and me before the fall, quote unquote, the fall. So there's this beautiful being, Persephone. Okay, that's me. And then she's so sweet and innocent. But then something happens. She gets kidnapped. That's what the story of Sophia is all about. The story of the soul is that once upon a time she lives with the divinity, the God, and the gods and goddesses, she's, she's sweet, she's innocent. And then there's this thing that happens. She gets kidnapped, which means we got caught in the material universe and forgot the pure universe. We got caught into a realm, like almost like the gravitational pull of the universe. So our soul got trapped here. What Persephone, what they say, is that Persephone ate of a poisonous pomegranate. And the reason it's a pomegranate, because originally it was not an apple, it was a pomegranate. And for, for various reasons. She ate of this pomegranate. So there's, this, there's still a chance. They're saying, okay, well, wait. Mm -hmm. Persephone could still be awakened, which means you and me. When we start to have doubtful thoughts, fear that a, a divorce is going to get the best of us, fear that a disease is going to get the best of us, when we get into the fear of it, we're actually inflating it. So what's happening is they said, Persephone, she got trapped, which is you believing something has power over you, like a, a partner from the past, a, an abusive person from your past. Oh, but I've been abused, now I'm trapped. No, you're not, but wait. So they say, before we know whether Persephone's trapped, we have to know, did she eat of the pomegranate? Yes, she did. And you know who told her that? Not the Furies, but the Fates. In Greek mythology, they're called the fate. What do you think that means? Now, fate has got her, which means karma. So once she bit from the pomegranate, is she still able to be you know, brought back? Quick, let's get her before she falls, before you and I fall, before you start to believe someone has power over you in a divorce or a business uh, transaction, somebody's taking advantage. Before you believe it, did you bite it? Did you, did you bite into it? Did you take the bait? Do you see the metaphor? Did you take the bait? So did she? Yes. The fates said, it's too late. 
she got captured, she got trapped. So that's what happens there. The later parts of Greek mythology become not per se Persephone being saved. That's the soul level of understanding. Now what we've done is gone from spiritual upper three chakra self down to the soul, Persephone in the heart, You're, you and me are innocent Eve. And then the fall in the garden is symbolized by us moving from the garden of Eden in our hearts down to the lower three chakras of humanness. Lower three chakras representing the third dimension. And now we're here. Fate would say, well, you're the one who bit from the apple, the pomegranate. Now you're stuck. You took the bait. You see what I mean by that? You, you bit it. You, you, took, you took it on. Okay, great. The rest of Greek mythologies, remember, are all, all about heroes and heroines, gods and goddesses in the making. So once we took the, the bait, it's not over. But Greek mythology changes too. Now it's up to you to become heroes. You see? Yes, you have fallen all the way to the human level, but you must wake up. How? Perseus, you know, and all the other male and females, what did they do? Those ones that went through stories. Greek mythologies are not for us to sit around and go, once upon a time. Greek mythologies are supposed to say, and in my life, how does this look? How does this apply to me? Whether it's Greek mythology or any other. How does this apply to me? Because now, mythology is telling you about how to wake up because the, the idea of leaving God is not something that can actually happen, but it's something that we can dream is happening. So what do you think mythology is? It's telling us about the dream. When you read about the book of, uh, in the Bible, Genesis, it's telling us about the dream of separating from God. You can't separate from all that is. Then it's at the end of the book, all the creepy uh, revelation stories. It's telling us about all the horrible things that could happen at the end of our lives, how life comes to a destructive ending. But really, the mythology is, no, it's actually when you finally are done suffering enough, you're going to wake up. Because the book of Revelation, as you've heard me say many times, ends with a wedding. So it's the marriage of our humanness to our soul and our soul to spirit. Because we have three identities. A spiritual self, a soul self, the spiritual self is the upper three chakras, a soul self, which is the heart, and a human self, which is the lower three chakras, the human self. So the bottom line is, we, we learned to live so much the human self that we have almost completely forgotten the soul self and definitely the spiritual self. We can sit around and affirm that we, that we know and remember the other self, but every time something seems to happen, and, and seemingly, seemingly go wrong, we bit from the apple again. Every time somebody says something or does something, I mean, and it's easy to get trapped. As soon as you accidentally, you know, you're hammering a nail and it hits your finger, ow, in that moment you bit, potentially bit and said, I'm a limited being and that hammer has just hurt me. I'm a spiritual being that can't be harmed. So this world is constantly hammering on us to take the bait that we're limited beings. Now, I'm not saying you've done something wrong and you gotta go, that did not hurt, that did not hurt, you know, so that you're more spiritual. <laughs> I'm not saying that that's the answer. What I'm saying is, it's actually healthier for us to go, ow, and then go, man, isn't that funny? I'm an unlimited spiritual being, and this thing, the head of which is only about an inch by an inch, just made me think that I'm a limited mortal. I mean, kind of see it and turn it into something to laugh about rather than to take so seriously. And, and I know that's not always easy, but that can be changed. So we're looking at these, these mythologies and look at Perseus, for example. He gets devoured by a monster. You know how long he stays in the monster's tummy before he comes back? Three days. So before, by thousands of years before there's a Jesus, there are stories of heroes that will descend into darkness for three days, which is us having to go into our dark night of the soul and come out the Christ. Well, I would, but, you know, Satan got me. No, that was Saturn trying to teach you something. What did you learn? Well, nothing, because I was so miserable. I was angry. I was sad that I was going through this. Oh, you forgot. See, you made yourself a limited human being who has someone out there named Satan just jabbing at, with his pitchfork from the other side in other dimensions, making you a, a miserable being. That's not what we're supposed to be studying and believing. We're supposed to be saying it all is part of me. 
And when I am going through hell, I'm not dragged into hell by the devil. I'm actually, the hell's in me. And Saturn has come to show me. And it's up to me to do something about it, to dissipate it. Now, another version of the creation story and our final one is what? In the beginning, there's God and God created us in God's image, right? We just simply believe we separate it from that love and that grace, that perfection of God's presence. So this is all good news. It, it's almost like God said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to channel to these people this one idea. Mankind or God's creation was made in God's image. They can't screw that up. Because if they, even humans look to the skies and say, you are almighty and you're made in my image. But we don't get that. You, only you are almighty. We're really a problem people here, man. And you are beautiful, but we're not. And you are timeless and we're not. And you are ageless and we're not. It doesn't make any sense. God's going, what's wrong with you people? I told you, you're made in my image. How can you say anything about me uh, that's of a beautiful, benevolent nature and not own it? That's sacrilegious. To try to change what God tells us is sacrilegious. It's, it's, it's rude. It's ridiculous. There's all kinds of other terms. The ancient Sumerians called it stupid. No. Um, <laughs> but it makes no sense. God creates us in its perfect and holy image. And we say, in response, our thank you is to say, we have a different opinion. It doesn't make any sense. That's why the great teachers of all teachers have said, it's about remembering. You don't have to improve upon yourself. It's just remember. Allow yourself to be who you really are. Divine, holy, but don't just say it. You have to start acting it too. Think it. Good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Let this be very, a very clear congruence. And even though I've said that we're made in the image of God, I also want to clarify. There's a creator and a created. And that's why we need that humility. Because the so-called fall in the Christian mysticism took place, how? It's when we were created in God's image and for a moment we thought to ourselves, what if we don't need the creator because we're creators now, so we'll just do this on our own. The idea that we could function without the original holiness of our, our, our source is where that arrogance, which they now then put on Satan, battled with Michael and the legions of angels because Satan wanted to take over heaven. That's not Satan, it's us. And if you say, well, I, I don't know if I agree, I don't... Forget that for a moment. Just think about what we do every day. Think about every day when we try to use our will instead of surrendering to the greater good that works through us. When we start to individuate in a negative sense, individuate in a negative sense, I know what's best. I have an opinion. I have a, instead of saying, I don't know. That's the only I we should be saying is, I don't know, because in the last shall be first. So if I learn to say, I don't know, all of a sudden I become, I am one with God. If I say, I don't need God because I'm cool, I fall again. And every time we think we'll fix our problems, if I just do, I need, I, I need a better income. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start charging more because I deserve it because my life coaches are telling me you deserve to charge more. I know that makes sense, but is it an inspiration? Well, inspirations don't give me the cash. I want more cash. See, so that's the little weak I am throwing a tantrum. It's very scary. Someone was just sharing this morning this beautiful thing they read in A Course in Miracles that said, you folks have gotten used to thinking that the way you try to fix your lives is the easy way and that studying spirituality is the chore. The spirituality is what teaches us the easy way. We've been working far too hard to try to not just improve our lives, we're actually, in trying to do it ourselves, we're sabotaging the answer. We've got to come back to finding that, that humility. So we are the created, not the creator. And being made in the image of God does not mean we of ourselves are God. We're a part of God. And, and it gets very complicated for some people, but again, summarizing. In the beginning, there's God, and we're part of God. We're part of the Trinity of God. We are the one they call the Son, but it means the child. So we are part of the Trinity of God. There's the Father, Mother aspect of God, and us. It's beautiful, perfect. 
The children of God, for various reasons, decided they could think that they could be separate. We descended into being individual souls, from a one spiritual God self to individual souls that reincarnate. Then we descended further into being humans with all these various bodies. And we actually think that our little few years on the planet is all we are. And some of us go, but I don't believe that anymore. I'm aware that there's an eternal self and it goes lifetime to lifetime. That's called the soul. So we have to learn to start identifying with our soul. It's a vaster consciousness. It's the one that is the, the, the memory of all. The Akashic records are the mind of the soul. So we have to get out of the petty littleness of, it's kind of like saying the difference between on a hand. Humans think that they're the fingertips. The soul is the hand. You see the difference? No, I don't like you. I don't get along with you. I have a different religion. I have the, the first finger religion. I have the pinky religion. You know, my politics are this, mine are that. You know, and then there's the middle finger politics. But <laughs> I just thought of that. But anyway, these are human beings talking. But wait, there's more. They're all part of the hand. So when we go through a veil and think that this is me, this is you, this, I don't agree. You take the veil away and look what happens. We start to go, God, that was silly, wasn't it? And this is what happens to human beings when they pass over. There's a certain amount, not a perfect amount, but a certain amount of, oh my God, what was I thinking? I thought that I was married to you in another lifetime. You betrayed me. I came back in this lifetime, betrayed you thinking, I'll get you back. But who's the you I'm getting back? Whoa, that was me beating myself up. You see, that's the greater soul. But I'm not forgetting that the hand is part of the body, and that's God. You see? So it's just a matter of perspective. We're sitting around talking about fingertip consciousness, but there's a hand, which is the soul, and then there's the body, which is God. Ultimately, we've got to get out of my littleness to who I really am. But the children of God temporarily thought, I'm something other. You know, I'm, 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 I'm not the body of God. I'm now a hand, which is a collection of souls. And then we go through a veil and we became individuated in a negative sense. All these individuals seemingly having individual experiences. As I'm coming to a close, now, here's some of our problems. I, this was all important to build the groundwork to this because now, what did I say? You have a spiritual self, a soul self, and a human self. And human beings tend to start talking about their problems. And, and remember, what it, from here on, try to remember, when I'm talking about my problems, I'm talking about my fingertips compared to the whole body. If my fingertips are touching a, a rock outside and it's real, let's say it's real sunny and hot out and it burns, I just move it. I move it. I can't go, well, fingertip, could you move please? It just goes, I can't, I'm a limited human being, man. I, I'm just stuck in this marriage or this job. Somebody's got to step up and be a little greater. Just know that. You don't say, oh, gosh, this is a sunny spot. I'm going to lay down naked on this rock. It, it, you go, oh, I, I think I learned. The one that thinks it learns is the soul. And it takes that lesson to the next lifetime and the next. It's kind of cool. But after the soul is done thinking that it's learning and healing, when ultimately we re-wed ourselves to the spiritual self, there were, and there were never any lessons. You were never flawed in the first place to learn anything. Because when God said, I made you in my perfect and holy image, it, we never needed to say, and we will improve upon that. <laughs> that does, think about it, it makes no sense. So all the learning and healing will ultimately end with laughter. Because, wow, isn't that weird? We're, we're still back to where we were in the first place. A journey without distance to a place we never left. Holiness. We, we find grace and we go, thank God, God bestowed grace upon me because I was doing these naughty things and, and I was feeling karma, but God gave me the law of grace. That, that just doesn't happen that way. What happens is I get over myself and I become the grace of God. It's not a thing bestowed upon us. 
It's something we become. The characters in Greek mythology, you know, they become like gods and goddesses again after being humans. But that was there all the time. We had it all along. But we have to remember it, but you can't just say, I'm remembering it as a sentence. You have to live it. You have to think it. You have to, you know, act it in everything, in every form. So to complicate it, though, the spiritual self is fine. There's a spiritual self in you and me that's still in heaven. And it cannot be separate from heaven, but it's gone to sleep, dreaming that it is a hand, a soul in the universe. And then the hand soul dreamt that it's a little individual body that's having this life sitting in this room right now. See, that's why mythology exists, because they're telling us about a dream. Mythology, not truthology. It's mythology. It's like once upon a time. There were these building, these beings made in oneness and you know with God, and they're all that God is. And then they thought they could go elsewhere. Bless you. They thought they could go elsewhere. And in going elsewhere, they started having all these strange experiences. And then eventually, they had an awakening, and they went home. The end. But at the end of the day, that was a loop that started and ended in the same place. One is with God, and that was the end of the story. But then it what if becomes a loop. And so we go through these games, we go through, but half of you, imagine this, half of you is still aware of your soul and half of you isn't. And here's how that works. Let's say the conscious human you says, I think I'm ready for a relationship now. And then nothing. I'm ready for the lottery and nothing. And a lot of us have done this, the spiritual work. Oh, lottery, lottery, lottery. You know. <laughs> Om, a new relationship, om, a new relationship. And we sit, we focus, we concentrate, we use affirmations on our mirror. I will have my relationship this week. My new relationship will come to me this week. Uh, here comes a Libran. Here, you know, whatever it is, we have these affirmations. That's the human self doing to try to get us something. And the soul's like, what are you doing? But we don't know how to commune with the soul. But here's what's happening. A lot of times, when you don't see things change and manifest, people are not remembering. The human self is going, but I've been doing it. I've been doing my affirmation. Yes, the human's been doing. However, the soul is saying, we have an agreement, man. Remember? Now the soul could be saying, we chose for a while. Let's see, what year is this? Okay, you got five more years. We chose for five more years to experience aloneness or all oneness. So the soul is going, what are you, why are you, why are you trying to find somebody? It doesn't make any sense. You're online, you're looking in the paper, you know, match, you know, or whatever they all, you know, hookups.com. So you're, you're looking for somebody, but we've already have an, we already have an agreement that you're not doing that. And I'm the soul. So I'm the one who will decide this. Soul's greater than the human little fingertip, right? So we're trying to win the lottery. We're trying to get that new job. And the soul is saying, we've already made an agreement that we're fasting from relationships for a while. Now the humanness is driving away to make that happen. Now you create more conflict and hurt feelings. Where's God? God's like way up here. A complete, there's human battling with the soul. And then there's the spirit. And that we're not even aware of. And God's going, what? That what relationships? You're one with all. What else could you need? No, no, I want somebody, a little somebody human special. God's like, no habla inglés. I'm out of here. So, <laughs> so the spiritual self is fine. The soul is, is in contracts. And the soul could be saying, for good reasons, we're fasting. Or the soul could be saying, we have some soul level wounds. Don't you remember that other lifetime? And the human fingertips going, I don't remember any of that. And the soul is going, well, denial is not going to help you. I remember the wounds, and until you heal the wounds, I'm not bringing you the lottery or whatever it is you're praying for. And then we accuse God of not answering prayers. But the conflict is within ourselves. The answer would be, and is, you can see in your life when things do manifest, it's when the human clicks the tumblers like on a lock. When the tumblers click, the human and the soul get it together. How? Get the human to go into a workshop or a center or a place of work to do healing of the soul. But when you go to heal the soul and somebody says, okay, we're going to work on the subconscious, the subconscious self, which is as much as deep as most people can go, the subconscious self is still only the subconscious of your human self. The soul is deeper. And unless you heal on the soul level, you're only helping a little bit. But sometimes you're only adding frustration because you do the work and it's not happening. 
I've done this work on this illness and it's not going away. The soul's like, whatever, I'm, 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 we've got a contract. Until you ask me, I won't be able to tell you anything. You want to ask me, I can give you some feedback. So you get the, a, a person who can help you reach the soul and you start getting insights. And sometimes the human isn't going to like it because the human wants what it wants, but the human is our limited self. So what it wants is not the good stuff. I want answers and I want them now. The human wants fast food spirituality. The soul is like, you know, oh, we're on, we're on Sedona time. You know, we'll just, we'll tell you when it's time. And we're like, no, I got to know now. So all we're doing is adding frustration. There's a spiritual self. There's the soul self. And the mythologies are actually telling stories of the soul self. So we can learn those, but then learn to shift the human self. And last but not least, you know, there's this, there's a lot of times, you know, when I'm teaching, what I'm, what I'm really working to do is, is share the truth. Get to the truth. Let's talk about the truth, sometimes even if it means dispelling illusions. So I, I leave you with this. Some people will say, um, you know, there's quotes like, um, everything's for a reason. You know, you might like that. It might be true. You know, you have to discern whether something's true or not. Some people will say, well, you only teach what you have to learn. That's actually not true. Almost everything that people say in the spiritual communities is not true. It's only partially true. People will say to you, you only teach what you have to learn. Actually, you teach what you have to learn or you teach what you have learned. I mean, come on. If you know how to sew, do I go, oh, uh, listen, here, uh, stitch me a shirt uh, because you still need to learn sewing apparently because you, you're still teaching it. That doesn't make any sense. Some people actually know how to change a tire because they've done it. They learn. They got it. And some people understand spiritual things. They're not just spouting it because they need to learn it more. So things you've learned, you have the right to speak about because sometimes you've learned them. It is also true that if you overdo it and you try to preach it to people, that's probably showing you there's a little bit of the insecurity that you still need to, to resolve and then there is something to learn. But don't believe that just because people have spiritual sayings that they're always true. So, you know, one of them that I, I you know, here, there's, there, there are so many. If you want to know more about those, look at the tirades I've done. We call them tirades, as humorously. <laughs> look at the tirades because those kind of talk about these, these ideas that tend to frustrate people. That you are God. Oh, there we go. So I am God. Mm, careful. Yes, you are God, but who am I talking to? If I'm talking to your spirit, yes, you are God. If I'm talking to your limited, broken, messed up human, it's not accurate anymore. So a lot of times people will throw out, spout out these sayings and they're just not true. They're, it's not that I'm saying they're trying to cause harm, but they're just not true. So I'm going to have you take a few centering breaths and I'm going to share the final one with you. The one that st seems to stand out the most lately. A few centering breaths, just tuning out the world, <coughs> only for a couple of minutes. Hmm. There is a saying, God loves you just the way you are. Hear that for just a moment. God loves you just the way you are. What does it mean? What does it feel like? God loves you just the way you are. That might bring you discomfort. It might bring you comfort. God loves you just the way you are. And humans have turned this into meaning the following. I have flaws, I have karma, idiosyncrasies, addictions, but God loves me just the way I am. That's not what it means. And then we project this, we say, God is so amazing. God is so forgiving, it even forgives me for all my flaws and loves me just the way I am. Actually, that's not true. God is not able to even see your flaws. The patience of God is not because it sees you 
and loves you despite your flaws, it's not even capable of seeing your flaws. God knows you before you became you, as you know yourself to be. So please meditate on this for a moment. God loves your divinity that has been there since the beginning of your creation. It's not to say it loves the human flawed self. I know it's hard to hear and wrap our minds around. It's good news to hear that God loves your, you for your divinity. God told Job, I knew you before you were Job. And God is telling you, I love you not despite your flaws. I love you because the real you has none. The real you is perfectly lovable. And what is that real me? And let's center on that for a few minutes. What is the real me? What is the, the me that God truly loves? And if I want to be loved by God, wouldn't it mean that I have to start accepting this part of myself? This holiness? Notice I need do nothing. As in Taoism, Course in Miracles, I need do nothing. I don't have to fix myself. And it doesn't mean I don't have work to do on earth as a human, but isn't it nice to know there's a part of me that's already there? That's already the state of grace? in a state of love. And this is the part of me I choose to be and become. My job now is to do my best to get my thoughts and actions to be in alignment and congruent with the spiritual self that is already the state of God, the state of love. And we close with a half a minute of visualizing in what way our actions, thoughts, words, behaviors would be different. If we're coming from this self, how would our life be different? And now begin giving thanks on every level, heart and soul thanks, but also Hear the feel and, and hear and feel all the people in your life. Imagine those people becoming aware of you being the love before you were the human. You being peace before you were the human. What if all of that falls away and we get to be our divinity? How does that change the lives of people around us? Less competing, less frustrations, less pushing and pulling, less I need a partner. All of that falls away and I am as God created me. I am the living Christ. And we breathe into an acceptance of that. And we are grateful for their gratitude. And so it is. Thank you. Just gradually stretch back into the body. Remember, here we, we, we don't encourage people to like have a, a, a good service, listen to message, or have a good meditation and then leave it. What we say is try to learn from that, integrate it, and let it change your life. Okay? All right. We're going to do our closing song in just a second. Before we do, we're also going to take up our collection. And, and beforehand, I'm going to just share these couple of things. <clears throat> First of all, remember, I've got a five-day mastery class coming up. You're all welcome to sign up for that. We've also got, starting this Wednesday, my online course on love and forgiveness. Really, really great people, really great class. You can attend in person here at Unity of Sedona or online. Sign up anytime, but sooner the better. Um, I also wanted to mention, somebody gave me a copy of her book, 
and Magdalene awakens Nancy Safford. She's out of town this weekend, but um, I, I read this book when I was on tour last week, and um, absolutely great, man. It's really a great book. It incorporates her life in Sedona and also in Glastonbury, a time she spent in England, rather, and, and her, her living examples of, of getting inspirations and trying to juggle those, and which, what's, what's spiritual inspiration, what's ego resistance, and all that. A very good, practical, live it kind of a, a book. Um, but really, really cool. I was very impressed, or I wouldn't be telling you about that, all right? So check that out. We might have them here. A Magdalene Awakens by Nancy Safford. And lastly, we're going to take up our collections. We'll do a prayer, and if you don't know the words, it's on the front of your bulletins. Um, keep in mind also, last Sunday was our end of the month. We came up about a grand short of last month's uh, expenses, so please help us be as generous as you can. The donations that go in the blue bags are the ones for the Sundays. The extra donations that go in the wicker baskets are for any extra donations you can give, whether it's for helping people of lesser means that we work with or whether it's special projects. But we appreciate that. We've got to get our uh, parking lot done within a month or two, and that's going to be a few thousand dollars. Um, and we want to finish our garden, and that's still another several hundred dollars. And also remember, it was mentioned, but I'm reminding you all, today is our auction day. We have that once a month. And uh, see those little, the little fairy village uh, over there? That's the ones we showed a picture of last week. Um, and those are in the auction if somebody would like those. All right? All right. Our prosperity prayer together. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. And so it is. Thank you. All right. And the folks watching online, we very much appreciate you joining us. We're going to sign off and do our closing song. Um, it'll be a good one. You're just not going to be involved. Um, <laughs> you, you have to miss out. No. Um, we don't play these songs live because they have copyright. So that's why we have to close out the, the online pr production before uh, we do our closing song. But bless you all and thank you for joining us and I pray it's made good sense um, before you actually go we're going to keep you on long enough to hear some sharing does anybody want to share what you learned or heard today that made the most sense or could be the most valuable to you and the folks online can type those things in as well what did you hear or learn yes I thought it was really interesting how the Bible the Greek mythology and all these different things that so many stuff. right so many places saying the same thing right and, and if they're all agreeing we wait a minute let's listen you know, what are they saying? That, that this whole concept, and, and the, the Greek mythology fits that, and the, and the cosmology fits it, that this is all our consciousness being reflected. A linear religion it took some of that and made it into a black and white story. You were born, you screwed up, you're all going to hell. <laughs> like, that, that's not there at all, if you look at the bigger picture. But what's funny is, the Bible that we're reading, that people are interpreting, saying this is what it says, factually came from other material that don't say that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like segmenting something from it, totally twisting it around and saying, and this is what God says. And God's going, I have nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you. I'm glad you, you got that and appreciated that. Anybody else? What did you learn or hear today that made the most sense or could be the most important? Yes? The darkness is there to help us to know that we are the light or bring us into the light. Right. That void, that darkness... Move, you know, upon the darkness, God's, you know, spirit moves upon the face of the deep. And in our lives, it's not just God once upon a time. Remember this, the canvas is blank. And if we know how to connect with God, we then become co-creators. And it's us, our mind moves upon the face of the deep and creates. The canvas is empty. What would you like to create? Well, here's what I want. Well, that's not creating. Now you're just trying to get something. When, if you're a, a magnificent being, what would you like to co-create? And now it becomes kind of a, wow, exciting and creative. And it's not me and you don't get it. Uh, it's my creations are always going to be for the greater good of all. And I get to get that too. I'm, I'm a part of that all, right? Anybody else? Yes? I kind of like this idea of Saturn coming back around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the one about Saturn coming back around. Satan's out to get me. No, it's just Saturn. Yes. To think of Saturn return is a kick in the astral. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a kick in the astral self. Yeah. Yes. You opened with we are all light workers. 
Yeah. We are light workers. And you know, and it's only light work while we still create anything contrary to the light of what we are, which means we're only having to work at our own sabotage that we put in place. And that work becomes play when we do this with God. All right? Thank you and peace be with all of you.